Um, we've got emerging collaborations with IECN, with WWF, WCS, CI, and others. Um, I'm going to go through this. Um, let me just say that we're involved now, and I'm going to end this pretty quickly here. We're involved in the strategic planning process. We want to exist beyond the life of ACSC. Um, we started in January with an internal strategic planning process at the University of Georgia. We are now moving toward an external consultation process, in which I um, consider this meeting part of that, uh, <coughs> to refine our um, research priorities. Um, and we've identified four so far, and these are a work in process. They are landscape histories and conservation planning and implementation. This is something, obviously, that a lot of people in C4 have worked on. Um, and I'm particularly aware of the stuff in Galena, but there's obviously a lot of uh, other work as well. Um, but as Kent Redford once pointed out to me, he said, he said, you know, landscape history, that's always used as a hammer to attack conservation, that you, you know, you're not taking account of it. Obviously, integrating landscape history into conservation planning can be a positive tool for conservation, particularly now that we're engaging with the climate agenda we're thinking about connectivity, we're thinking about the impermanence of protected areas, um, and so forth. Secondly, the role of the social sciences in conservation. This really gets at that last point I made in the last slide about trying to, to, to gauge how we think about the social context, local contexts, and broader social and political context in conservation with the shift from protected areas to more market-based and other kinds of mechanisms. Innovation and collaborative methods, um, really refers to some of the, uh, a lot of the collaborative work that, again, that pe people here have been doing, but that also, and here I'm speaking particularly as an anthropologist, where we've been pretty uh, seriously attacked by a lot of indigenous communities for the way we work and, and you know, the, and the way we've worked in the past in extractive ways. Um, and there are, I think, a lot of, there are still lessons that we are learning that are emerging in that literature. Um, that can be applied to conservation. Um, and finally, emerging conservation strategies. And really, that, from my perspective, is kind of a birthing ground for identifying future research priorities. And so, so for instance, the, the climate change agenda. What does that mean for conservation? Um, um, there are lots of, um, you know, again, all these emerging uh, market-based mechanisms. Conservation is changing. Uh, dramatically today, and um, we think it's important to kind of uh, be, be tracking those changes and try to understand them and see how they shape the broader conservation domain. And so, um, this is the external consultation process. Um, so I think I'm going to, uh, I think I'm going to end there. Um, I've gone through things rather quickly, um, but I'd be interested in hearing from you what you think about um, whether you talk about the framework, or uh, you uh, have something to suggest that we're missing uh, at CICR, that it's something that we might do, or ways we could uh, build collaborations. Um, so, thank you. So, uh, I'll open the floor up to uh, suggestions, questions, comments. Probably a bit academic, but what do you mean by landscape history? The, mm -hmm. How the landscape has evolved by a physical over time or more of a social context? <coughs> um, what I think, first of all, I, I mean, the thing that we have discovered, we've been doing some scoping on this, is that this literature is all over the place. Uh, and it's very hard to, uh, you know, to, uh, you know, there, there are folks working in European context and, you know, in, in all kinds of time spans. Um, one of the, I think the thing, and, and here I suppose this is me as an anthropologist speaking, when I think of it, I think um, primarily in terms, um, not in the sort of deep time kind of uh, uh, context. Um, recognizing, of course, that, you know, that you know, conservation, particularly when they're talking about restoration, they need to establish the baseline, right? But I'm thinking about contexts like the Calabit Highlands, where Sarah, has, Sarah Hitchner has been doing her dissertation research, where that landscape is full of, of history. You look at it, it looks like a forest. It's full of, it's not just you know, burial sites and, and, and megaliths and so forth, but you know, rows of fruit trees and so forth. And that 
if you know, that, that, that can be documented and that can be used as a positive tool in conservation planning. Um, there, are, there are lots of models for doing this, um, but they have not been, um, I think, um, applied uh, much at all um, outside of Europe and you know, a little bit in the U.S. and you know, other places. But. Yeah, main if not from from Ica. Yeah. Good. Uh, thanks. A lot of very interesting stuff. We we work on this negotiation support systems and multiple knowledge and multiple mm -hmm. you know, pluralism and all that from. Uh, you referred to the debate in the past about what community means. Mm -hmm. At the moment, we're very interested in the evaluation process and power of one very simple word that is at the core business of this center here, and that is the word forest. And I know the current debate about climate change and all that very much hinges on that single term. Yes. New international agreements will be probably made soon that, that refer to that. And yet the, politics of the power of who's, what does it mean and what does it not mean is a very important one. Have, have you, in your last answer, suggested you in case studies yeah, be, uh, be nibbling on the edges of that? Yeah, I mean, we have not, we have not addressed that issue. I'm, I'm acutely aware of that issue. A lot of my previous research in Israel, I work with uh, Kanan, a group of front gathers who became famous for blockading it. In yeah. the context of that, followed a lot of Malaysian debates. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, and precisely about force, and now we see this with with uh, plantations and so forth, where the countries obviously want to carbon stuff or whatever. Um, um, so we've not looked at that, but I but I, um, I'd be interested in hearing more about what you're doing on that front because I, I absolutely agree. And that that precisely is one of those I would consider that one of those um, uh, implicit. Uh, you know, uh, uh, <coughs> excuse me, context in which power is being exercised by who's defining what a forest is, etc. Yeah. Your third bullet point now yeah. um, is kind of a, very relevant to, to our, our own research in linking and influencing the conservation actors. I don't know you phrased it as a question, but have you got any insights into actually influencing? Conservation practice, uh, um, <clears throat> especially linking the academic to the practitioner. Yeah, um, I think. Well, first of all, uh, and, and here I think I'm trying to channel Tom McShane, who's the PI of the project, but I don't want to answer for him. He's thought a lot about this issue. Um, some of the other folks, we, we've all thought a lot about the, this issue, and uh, I think. One of the one of the issues that we have come up against, uh, or that we've heard uh, articulated, is the distinguished distinction between con content-driven research and demand-driven research. <coughs> and you know, the point was made by someone from one of the major conservation organizations that you know, if there's no demand for it, you can do this stuff to you're blue in the face, and who cares about it? So the question then, to me, is a strategic one. If you just sit around and wait for your work to be in demand, you're not going to be very relevant. Um, we think this potential and the focus on trade-offs that, that you guys are undertaking, um, that there are strategic ways to ensure that it is taken into account by the conservation community. Obviously, one route would be through, um, through donors. Um, <laughs> and of course, what, what does that mean? One of the interesting, one of the uh, other pieces of research that we um, sponsored is a, is a focus on um, conservation funding and sort of trends in conservation funding. One of the most interesting findings, I don't know if you were there for that presentation in Beijing, but when we think of conservation funding, and we think about USID and, and you know, GDF and various other kinds of and multilateral and bilateral funders, and we think about the big foundations, the interesting finding of that research, and, and and you know the people doing the research were very careful to say, listen, we're still massaging the numbers and trying to sort out, you know, what all of it. But but still, I think the quantum is interesting. The big foundations, MacArthur, Moore, Packard, all those that support conservation, three percent of conservation funding. Okay, 
very, it's a very small percentage. Uh, whereas the bilaterals are much, I think, around 60 plus percent. Okay. Now that's interesting. Be, that doesn't mean that you should ignore the, that little three percent slice because, as the subsequent discussion you know moved forward, someone made the observation that yeah, but those guys can move very quickly and very innovatively in ways that the big funders can't. And so, um, you know, we think it's important to to try to influence the funding community. Um, and you know, and this is something, you know, that possibly. You know, through your work on trade-offs and through the stuff that we've been doing on trade-offs might, you know, might be a nice uh, synergy or something.